Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inshallah, we'll uh, continue today with chapter 7. Chapter 7 has a lot of uh, material, so I'm going to probably divide it into two parts. And it's about uh, uh, discovery of cells and uh, some uh, details about the components of cellular of cells. So, um, the history of cell theory. Cells, as you probably already know, are the basic unit of living things. In other words, uh, yeah, you're made of millions and millions of cells, and uh, but a cell has all the characteristics of a living thing. Anything smaller than a cell does not have the characteristics of the living things, the four characteristics of living things. So cells are the most fundamental basic units of living organisms. Um, and we, we wouldn't know about cells in, uh, until the discovery of uh, our invention of microscopes. So microscopes is what allowed scientists to view cells and to actually see microorganisms uh, um, uh, under the scope, so to speak. So microscope is, uh, uh, history is very important. And among the first to look at microscopic things was uh, uh, this um, uh, gentleman, Ant Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. This is somebody uh, worth knowing, uh, who's a Dutch tradesman who spent count countless of hours just peering into this little tiny uh, rudimentary microscope, so to speak. So Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, 1632 to 1723. So he's uh, considered typically to be the father of microbiology, and he made handcrafted microscopes, and he was a little bit of a joke about his art, apparently. He would not share how he would actually craft these lenses, and which was apparently a pretty simple thing to do, but he pretended that it was very tough and really didn't share it with most people, the knowledge of how he actually crafted these uh, lenses. Nevertheless, well, uh, that's the human element of the story. But he made handcrafted microscopes and he'll put a little tiny lenses there and he put he would put a little single drop of of whatever he wanted to examine over here and just look through it. Uh, he would put it over here and he would just look through this lens of microscope and he was he saw some remarkable things. Uh, he was the first to describe single cell organisms and he described like you know like an amoeba and, and paramecium and things which we'll study in the future inshallah. And he was the first to describe these uh, single cell organisms, and he called them um, anima animalcules, it means small microorganisms, animalcules, small molecules, small animals. He also, so he does describe bacteria, or muscles, fibers, etc. And, uh, and then the invention of the light microscope. Uh, aided uh, immensely in uh, understanding this microscopic life, uh, so to speak. A light microscope is really nothing more than a a light source, which is reflected upon, or sometimes it's not. It's just a light bulb. It could just be like sunlight that could be reflected with the mirror. It is reflected onto uh, uh, where the specimen is, is, and so the specimen is lighted from the background light, so to speak. So it's like shining a light from beneath the specimen. And the specimen image is enlarged using um, lenses. If there is more than one lens, in, uh, lens involved, it's called a compound microscope. Uh, compound meaning more than one. So if there's more than one lens, as it typically is, it's called a compound microscope. And in this case, it would be a compound light microscope. So compound light microscopes, which are still commonly used, uh, uh, can enlarge an image up to 1,500 times its original size. So these are red blood cells uh, that are being observed under a microscope. Uh, as you can see, they would be invisible to the naked as blood part. But under a microscope, you can see quite remarkably how, how they look. So uh, this was the next gr gr great invention in the understanding of micro microbiology. So this is a basic structure of a uh, light microscope, the light source. Uh, and the condenser lens focuses the light and the specimen is kept over there and there, there are a series of lenses over here and mirrors that uh, reflect light to the eyepiece over there. So here's a quote from Anthony von Leeuwenhoek. He said, I've spent more time than many will believe 
making microscopic observation but I have done them with joy and I have taken no notice though of those who have said why take so much trouble and what good is it it's quite interesting he's a little peering up this thing is that people think he's being ridiculous but he changed our understanding of the world the next great individual uh, who uh, to make mark uh, in, in this aspect of uh, uh, science history is this English gentleman Robert Hooke uh, Robert Hooke was a contemporary of uh, Leeuwenhoek, and Leeuwenhoek uh, was famous. I mean, he was like a world famous, world famous figure. You know, monarchs would go visit him, but Robert Hooke was in his own uh, way uh, uh, quite remarkable as well. So he used a compound microscope and he started looking things uh, under the microscope and he saw these things. And what he did was actually he took a, a bark. Uh, cork from an oak tree, and and he uh, and he took this cork and then and he analyzed and he saw these little uh, uh, shells of former cells, uh, there and, and shells the ghost of former cells and he called them little cells cells meaning like a room, and the name stuck, so that's how we get the name cells for these uh, uh, these little entities that he saw. So he was the one who na named cells cells. Robert Hooke. The next, next thing that we like to appreciate is something called the cell theory. So there was a time when people used to think that living things came from non-living things. Uh, for example, in the, there was a, uh, a, a, a belief that you know w there are worms on the street after it rains uh, because uh, when it rains, the rain uh, kind of works on the uh, fallen hair from the horses, and then that hair, these hairs. Uh, growing to uh, worms, uh, so the, the such the theories would seem uh, silly to us today, but they, they were widely prevalent. People didn't know how living things came about, uh, but uh, and gradually those uh, uh, theories were proven wrong, uh, and then now we understand how uh, one living things come, uh, one living thing comes from another living thing, etc. And this is called the cell theory. The cell theory, and we'll talk about in detail, these three individuals are responsible for laying the groundwork for the cell theory. So uh, Matthias Shilton, for example, he observed that all plants are made of cells. He looked at many, many, many different plants under the microscope and he made a conclusion that all plants are made of cells. It's quite a statement to make if you think about it. Here's Robert Hooke has discovered, now this is much later, it's like 1800, Robert Hooke already discovered like, you know, uh, cells. But to claim that all plants are made of, made of cells is quite a remarkable thing. Now, you personally, how many plant cells have you looked under a microscope, right? But, but, so this, I mean, you, but now we take it for granted that all, all plant cells are made of but, but plants are made of cells. But he studied considerably and he observed this quite a remarkable phenomenon that all plants, as different as they are, whether it be from a rose bush to an oak tree, they're all made of very similar looking things and, and, and called cells. Similarly, Theodore Schwann made a similar uh, uh, observation with animals. He observed many animal tissues and he noticed that all of them are made of similar uh, structures and uh, 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 cells. So if between between these two gentlemen, uh, uh, all plants appear to be made of cells and all animals made to appear cells. Now the importance of these cells as structures, a structural component of living things emerges, right? If you think about it, every every plant is made of cells and every animal is made of cells. Man, cells must be something pretty important. So where do they come from? How does a small little, little seed grow into an o uh, uh, into a giant plant and the like acorn grows into a, uh, a, a an oak, so to speak? How does this happen? How, where do all these billions of cells come from? Well, that was the third part of the cell theory. And it was Rudolf Virchow, who's very famous in the medical profession. Virchow suggested that all cells come from pre-existing cells. So all these t plants that have all these cells, they all they come from pre-existing cells. This is like human populations. The children come from parents, and the parents come from their grandparents, so to speak. So these are the three elements uh, that are very important in understanding. And they were not, uh, to us, they're quite natural to appreciate, but these are quite groundbreaking theories. 
And uh, this is a uh, uh, shield and shuan that, that we have already spoke of and studied plants and animals respectively and speculating on where that came from. This is 1800s, late, 18, late 1830s. And so we have the cell theory. And this this is Vercal, as I have suggested, Rudolf, in his later years, who's also very important for for uh, uh, sanitation work. Uh, he is a German anthropologist and is a, a physician of uh, sorts uh, old days. And then he uh, uh, he realized that uh, many diseases are transmitted uh, because of poor uh, sanitary conditions. So uh, some of the great works of of in the, in the European that he had. Uh, for sanitation um, uh, 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 sensitivities were because of his efforts. Okay, to uh, think about it for a second, that too we take for granted, but to to, micro, to to suggest that these microorganisms exist, we know that, and then they're responsible for diseases, we know that, and then they are uh, uh, they they thrive in poor sanitary conditions. These are uh, some connections you have to make, and in those times it was not an obvious connection to make. So that's the groundwork that was laid in forming the cell theory. So cell theory has three important aspects that we have already alluded to. First is all living things are made of one or more cells. Every living thing that you can imagine. Uh, there's some elements of dispute in certain exceptional cases, but in general, all, uh, uh, it's agreed upon that, um, uh, most scientists agree upon, that all living things are made of one or more cells, okay? Um, for viruses are not cells, for example, they're not cellular structures. So they, most scientists actually say viruses are not living things. Uh, we will have an opportunity to talk about that more in the future. But nevertheless, uh, first part of cell theory is that all living things by far are made of one or more cells. Like there are such things as unicellular, one-celled organisms like the amoeba, for example. The second part of cell theory is that the cell is the smallest unit of life. In other words, anything smaller than a cell is not living. So, so the, all the components of the a cell are not living things, like proteins, the nucleus, and um, right. They're they're not living things. So the, the 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 smallest unit of something that you can call living, this thing is alive, is a cell. Anything smaller than a cell is not considered to be living. So first, a part aspect of the cell theory is that all living things are made of one or more cells. The second aspect of cell theory is that the cell is the smallest unit of life or living thing. And the third aspect of the cell theory is that all new cells come from pre-existing cells. All new cells come from pre-existing cells. So this is the cell theory. So it's one of the most fundamental paradigms of biology, biological sciences, and you must know this, inshallah. Now, we talked about how Lewin Hug started out with this little tiny microscope, you know, squinting, you know, and then how the light microscope that, that Robert Hooke uh, used. And, and then the next great advances were occurred actually uh, in the uh, 20th century, not that long ago. So in the 1930s and 40s, uh, uh, electron microscopes were invented. Okay, electron. Now compare the mic uh, magnification of a light microscope, like fifteen hundred times the uh, the size of an object, fifteen hundred times the size of your object, to five hundred thousand times the size of your object, which is quite stunning uh, 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 if you think about it. So you can you can magnify by five hundred thousand times. To me, that's quite actually mind-boggling. This is like, you know how you have a telescope, the uh, Hubble telescope looks peers into the galaxies, right? Uh, far away. So these are like the, uh, the uh, looking into the uh, galaxies, microscopic galaxies, so to speak. So these are quite uh, amazing things. The two most popular, widely used uh, uh, of uh, uh, microscopes are these, these two that are here. Uh, one is called the scanning electron microscope. The second is called the transmission electron microscope. So scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope. Scanning electron microscope is kind of like Braille. When when uh, people who uh, people who are uh, uh, who do not have sight, they use their fingers, so to speak, kind of uh, to get a feel for what's written on paper. That's scanning. So that's how kind of and it gives beautiful three dimensional images that you'll see, which I find quite uh, remarkable. That's scanning. Okay. 
transmission electron microscope is very different. In transmission electron microscope, you make tiny, very, very, very thin slices, and you basically and you pass through electron beams through it. These, these both of these use electrons. In scanning electrons, the electrons kind of use like touch the surface and they bounce off of the surface. Uh, 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 and then the uh, uh, the transmission, the, the cut is so thin they just go through the material, and they give exceptional detailed images uh, of uh, uh, of the um, specimen. So that's the difference: scanning electron microscope versus transmission electron microscope. So here's what happens when scanning electron microscope an electron beam is 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 thrown at the at the sample and uh, it, it 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 bounces off various different things and that's what's detected and a three dimensional image is constructed using that. Um, compare that to a to a transmission electron microscope where you have a high voltage you have an electron gun so to speak you have you know. You know uh, uh, and a, a little um, uh, gun, so to speak, that generates a, f a beam of electrons that's condensed, is sharpened uh, all the way up to where the specimen is. Uh, specimen is kept over here, and then the, the beam just goes straight through that, and the floor, this is uh, this the screen here actually is over here, so a beam of electron is going through there. Okay, so that's the. Uh, this is a comparison of light microscope, which we understand to uh, scanning electron. Uh, so here's a comparison of the three types of microscope. This optical microscope, where the light is, is, is either sunlight or a light uh, from uh, uh, from a light bulb, is condensed into the image, and it's uh, here. I think it's going this way. The sunshine is coming here in the specimen. And you view it. Transmission electron microscope, uh, the electron beam goes through this specimen, and in scanning electron microscope, it doesn't go through it, it scans it, and then the, uh, the data is collected, and a three-dimensional image is constructed. There are other types of microscope, which we'll talk about uh, briefly thereafter. So here's a scanning electron microscope. So here, look at the specimen over here. Here, we're going to examine like a little bug over here, okay? That looks pretty interesting over there. Now look at this. These pictures are these two over here are generated by a scanning electron microscope. As I said, it's like a braille. It gives you like a three-dimensional pictures of very small things. This, I believe, is pollen grains. Uh, I don't know what microorganism that. This is pollen grains, um, and uh, quite remarkable three-dimensional uh, uh, pictures uh, of very small things. Compare that to. Uh, transmission electron microscope and it gives you very detailed images of cells the subcellular structure you don't see stuff like this in a, in a light microscope and this is a, a not magnified it gives you exceptional detailed pictures look at this this is a scanning electron microscope you add a little color to it you know make it look prettier so that's remarkable remarkable pictures of very small things and look at the, uh, this is blood, and these are red cells, and these are white cells in blood, and in, in, in this tiny blood vessels from a scanning electron microscopes, and I find this quite beautiful pictures. And then look at the transmission electron microscopes, and these are microtubules, you appreciate what these are in the future. This is exceptionally detailed pictures of, uh, of the subcellular structures, uh, s s stuff that is smaller than, uh, uh, a small, very, very small part of the cell. Here's more pictures of um, a transmission electron microscope. There's other types of microscopes, as I suggested. Uh, this one is is the uh, scanning tunneling microscope. This is the interesting uh, thing. This is this is the as detailed as you can get. So you take a little tiny jet of electrons that are that that come from over this tip of this uh, uh, electrode, and then it, it does one of these. So it kind of like pulses and goes to the tissue like this, all right? And the same way, the tiniest pulse of electrons, and then it goes to the whole tissue slowly, and then kind of like the uh, braille, so to speak, but using the tiniest amount of electrons, and it gives you the most detail, almost at an atomic level. Look at this. This is a scanning tunneling microscope of a silicon at an atomic level. That's not an atom per se. 
but it, it, it's 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 like a vague image of, of what it, what it might be. So this is just this is quite quite amazing. So that's our introduction uh, to this chapter. Um, after a brief pause in the show, I will talk about uh, uh, two types of cells and some basic elements of uh, uh, cellular structure, inshallah. Until then, as-salatu wa salamu wa rasulullah wa rahmanullahi wa rabbil alameen. As-salamu alaykum.